So why an unlearn on, on mindfulness? Well, when three of the caregiver facilitators on this unlearn started chatting with each other, which we very frequently do, we discovered that mindfulness came up as a common thread. What we all had in common was that mindfulness had been suggested as something that we might benefit from, but we also discovered that we all had different ideas about what that meant, what we needed, how to do it, when to do it. We wondered whether it was a solution, was it a therapy, was it guided, was it facilitated? And it was this light bulb moment when we recognized that all of us perceived it very, very differently. And we wanted to explore the, that. Yet the more we explored and the more in depth we got, the more confused we became and the less clarity we had. We realized that we really needed to start unlearning, which of course we know involves learning. So that was a little information about Nathan, Aideen and myself. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Yona and Teresa to introduce themselves. Thanks, I'll go first. Uh, I'm Teresa. Uh, I'm really happy to be here and part of this conversation today. And I'm working with the Israeli team and on different engagement projects, so working closely with autistic self-advocates and also caregivers. Uh, I have a, a background and trained as a social worker and previously worked in an outpatient clinic for adults with neurodevelopmental disabilities and mental health concerns. And also a big part of my story is that I'm a, a sibling in a neurodivergent family. And a, a big part of that is that my my older brother is autistic. That's a little bit about me, and I'll turn it to Yona. Hi, everyone. So my name is Yona. Um, I'm at, here at CAMH. I direct the Israeli Adult Neurodevelopmental Center. Um, so I'm 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 here. I think because I've been studying mindfulness for some time. Um, I guess not so much. I'm talking about my personal study, but about sort of a research area I've been interested in, uh, and. Uh, yeah, I also uh, wear a family hat like to, like Teresa. I'm a sibling, uh, and I think a lot about uh, how mindfulness is relevant to caregiving. And before Teresa takes over, I realized us three caregivers actually didn't tell you much about our caregiving. So, Adine, would you like to introduce yourself to the group? Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Adine, and I work at the Israeli Center, along with Nathan, we're both co-facilitate, uh, we're co-facilitators, engagement facilitators for programs that go on at the Israeli Center. I'm caregiver parent to a 26-year-old autistic young man who is also a mental health service user and has multiple complex needs. Nathan. Leanne, would you like to say something about you right now, or would you want to wait until you hear your story? Let's do that. We will wait. Okay. So we'll I'm keep Nathan. everyone in suspense. Yes, be in suspense. Um, I have a 23 year old uh, autistic son who also has a developmental disability and deals with issues of mental health and substance use. Um, and uh, Teresa, take it away. Thanks. So I think uh, to get this to get things started, if we could go to the next slide, and we're going to have a, a bit of an activity here. Um, so you'll see something pop up on on the side for to we want to we want to know what you all think mindfulness is. Um, one or two words. Um, I think it's it's clear that we all have different ideas and concepts about what mindfulness is. So if you could drop it, there should be a little box for your response. You could uh, drop uh, different things that you associate when you hear mindfulness. Could be anything. Could be if you're if you're not sure that I think that counts as well. Yeah, it's neat to see the that word code develop in front of us. Yeah, and of course, a word cloud, the bigger the word is, the more response uh, people that are putting it in. So meditation, awareness, calm, being present. I, triggering, scary. 
Yeah, really, really interesting. We'll just give it another another few seconds for people to get some their their ideas in there. Again, question mark. Yeah. Intimidating. Yeah, what a what a what a beautiful representation of kind of the uh, the the breadth of what it can mean for people, and and I think that that's uh, that's really interesting to see this, um, and kind of yeah the, the 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 diversity that it is, and I think that if um, thank you everyone for participating uh, in that uh, and and creating this this beautiful visual that will help us to lead us into kind of our next portion of this talk, which I think that hearing a little bit more about maybe the history of mindfulness or where it came from. Um, might might help to inform <clears throat> why maybe we have different ideas uh, about what it is and what it can do for us. So I'll pass it off to Nathan. So mindfulness as a term is an English translation of an ancient word which meant memory or to remember to be aware of, which is the object of Buddhist meditative att attention for spiritual growth. Buddhists believe that human life is one of suffering and that meditation, spiritual and physical labor, and good behavior are the ways to achieve enlightenment or nirvana. Next slide. In the 40s and 50s, there was an interest, uh, particularly in the US, in the artistic beauty of certain Buddhist practices. And then later, moving on to the late 60s and the 70s, there was the psychedelic era and expanding your mind and being part of pop culture and at this time for example the Beatles made their concept album and they were uh, in transcendental meditation as a practice and this is all part of my own personal hippie past and in fact i i started meditating as part of transcendental meditation back in 1979 and I was very influenced at that point in time by the arts, music, mind expansion. And so the historical path, I know sometimes history can be a bit boring, but this context uh, is my lived experience. You can have the next slide, please. All right. So at around the time of, of uh, Adine's transition to hippiness, um, clinicians saw and measured biological changes in the hearts and bodies of people after meditation. One clinician, John Kabat-Zinn, who was trained in Buddhist meditation techniques and philosophy, specialized in chronic pain reduction and found that mindfulness meditation was successful in his clinic. He branded this as the mindfulness program. This created interest from other Western psychotherapists and clinicians for using mindfulness practice for physical and mental health outcomes. Over time, mindfulness-based programs have been shown to be a cost and time efficient way to help a greater number of patients than maybe some other treatments. Next slide, please. So mindfulness programs, along with other clinical practices, eventually were repackaged during the self-help movement. And this was seen as a way for individuals to take control over their mind and behavior without being dependent on formally structured program. And it could be something we could do in our own time. And again, this little journey has been very much part of my own personal journey, evolving from pop culture as a younger adult, three caregiver days, um, through multitudes of self-help books. And in this particular context, my, being mindful is packaged as a catch-all to deal with life stresses. Uh, including illnesses and woes. And I acknowledge that this is helpful to some, but not to others. Next slide, please. So we're gonna we're gonna share a a uh, a link for you uh, for a little bit of more uh, information about the basics of mindfulness, but. Today, we are left with a wide range of what counts as mindfulness practice and programs. Elements of mindfulness can still be found in modern spiritual practices around the world, such as prayer. Uh, mindfulness is also offered to us as useful for all aspects of life, 
from mindful sex to coping with prison life to the stress of the stock market. With all the diversity of programs, practices, and purposes, it can be confusing to understand what mindfulness and mindfulness programs really consist of. So Yona's gonna help us sort that out. Thanks, Yona. Yona, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, I wasn't being fully present to notice that I hadn't unmuted the mute button. Um, uh, just to say, there's been really interesting unlearning for me too, because I think I always just assumed, I guess, or for the last while, because I'd been sort of studying this and talking about it for some time, that we were all talking about the same thing and that stuff was pretty clear. And the more we talked with each other, the more we realized how sometimes we're thinking different things, even with the same words, right? So I kind of wanted to step back and just talk about what are some of these basic things that are in maybe what we call mindfulness and also the difference between something like mindfulness, a mindful practice and a mindful program. So um, sometimes I use a, a, the definition you'd mentioned John Kabat-Zinn before um, and, uh, and he says that mindfulness is awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose in the present moment non-judgmentally. So there's certain components of that and you can see some of them in this nice visual here. Um, I think one aspect of mindfulness, being mindful, is being in the here and now. So not being sort of caught up in stuff that happened before, that maybe you wish didn't happen or that was so lovely you wish you were back there, uh, and not being so worried um, and, and imagining all the stuff that's going to happen later. So it's being right here, right now. Um, often there's this kind of connection between maybe what our thoughts are doing and, and where we are in our own space, in our own body. So whether it's you know, noticing what it feels like um, uh, in, our, in our breath or noticing how um, our body feels sitting on a chair or being aware of certain kinds of pains or sensations that we have in our body, um, you know, noticing what we're seeing, what we're smelling, what we're tasting, something about what we're experiencing on a sensory level and how that's connected to what we're thinking. And then this other part in the bottom sort of red there, it's this sort of being an observer. So sort of instead of being on the train, kind of watching the train or the clouds go by, uh, and, and doing this kind of observing or noticing of things in a, in a not so judgmental kind of way. So we sort of attach stuff. When we think about things, we think about them in a certain way. And if you don't have judgment about it, it just is. It's neither good nor bad. So mindfulness, I think, is that kind of um, act of, of doing those things. But how we do it can be very different depending on, on who we are and sort of what makes sense to us. So mindfulness practices, I think about as sort of activities that we decide to do so that we can practice being mindful. Because actually it's very difficult sometimes to be mindful. We're very good at being mindless uh, and sort of missing uh, or not paying attention. So we have to actually practice, you know, any skill we wanna be able to pull at uh, in a difficult moment, we have to practice it a lot. So it's sort of a little more automatic or easy for us to do, especially in stressful situations. So one kind of practice might be a sitting meditation but you might also make a mindfulness practice that is simply listening when you're um, turning on the kettle for when the whistle goes, right? So the practice just means something that you're doing, I think, to be mindful. And then there's actual programs. So you talked about the program that John Kabat-Zinn um, sort of developed, and sometimes we call that mindfulness-based stress reduction. And that was my first exposure to mindfulness. It's an eight-week course that people take. Um, and uh, um, it's done in a certain way, in a certain order, people who are trained, uh, to teach that course are the ones who teach it, and they've had very specific training on how to teach to do that course. Um, but of course, there's been lots of sort of spin-offs or other ways that people might learn mindfulness. So there's um, another program is mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is more of a therapeutic intervention that originally was developed to help people um, sort of after they had an experience of depression to avoid um, a relapse of that depression by learning how to be mindful and present to kind of notice when things are starting to shift and then learn new strategies to deal with that. But programs can be sort of in person, they can be uh, in a group, they can be uh, virtual, they can be on your phone, they can be something you listen to, um, you know, that comes with a book. So how we sort of study mindfulness or learn mindfulness practices can be done in many different ways. Um, myself, I've been interested in how we um, learn mindfulness in a group setting. 
through a program, which is kind of a spin-off of some of the things I was just talking about, but specifically for family caregivers, thinking about some of the restrictions and challenges and limitations and needs that family caregivers have that might be different than other people who are looking uh, as mindfulness as a possibility. So it's been something we've sort of been studying and learning about for several years. Um, and uh, maybe in our conversation after, I'll talk a bit more about some of the things we've learned. So much, Yona. Sorry, I have I have too many tabs open on my on my computer. Um, I I find I, I just think that this is all very interesting for for me to think about in both learning and unlearning in the process of planning this webinar and all the different experiences that people can have with with mindfulness and uh, and how it's done and also in in how it makes them feel. And I have to admit. I, I come at this and I, I feel a bit biased based on where I'm coming at this from. Um, I'm in the early days of, of a new practice for myself. I'm just over one and a half years in uh, to daily, a daily practice. And when I, when I reflect on the, the impact that it's had on me personally, and this sounds really cheesy and I'm not a cheesy person, but it's really the best way for me to describe it, but it really changed me. It, it changed my life and, and, for, the, and for the better. Um, and I've worked in the mental health field for what feels like a really long time. I, I know it's available. Uh, I know that mindfulness is an option and then it works well for some people. I always had this idea that it wouldn't work for me or I wouldn't be able to do it properly. Um, or just the way my brain was, it, it wasn't an option. But last, last year for me, uh, things took a bit of a bad turn. Uh, and within the context, even in the context of uh, the ups and downs that come along with lifelong mental illness, last year was different. Uh, I think a lot of people might relate with that. Second year into the pandemic and working in the mental health field, it was just, it was different. Uh, and it was bad. And I, I knew I needed to do something different. And it was pretty much out of survival. Like I, something, so I, something needed to change. So I decided I was going to get really serious about meditation. Mindfulness was a big part of that for me, is a big part of that for me, and I was going to give, a, give it a really proper go and, and see what happened. So at the beginning of that, I stuck with it for, for 30 days, daily meditation, um, uh, including mindfulness as that practice. And after those 30 days, I knew I wanted to continue with that daily practice. Uh, I started to feel like I, fe I felt it. I felt the noticeable improvements in, in my health. And they were, the, those feelings were hanging around for longer than they had with other things that I had tried. Um, of course, stuff still happens. There are still lots of bad days, uh, but it's the way I could say it is like the intensity and frequency of those flare ups have definitely decreased and it's a, I have additional tools in my toolbox um, to use when when those flare ups happen. And also, I really, I, I realized that specifically mindfulness, it was really natural for me and that I had actually been practicing informally for a really long time. Um, and that was uh, that was a really helpful realization for me because it made it a lot more. Uh, I, I knew I could do this um, and I went the self guided route. And uh, it, that that worked for me so far, and I'm at a place now where I'd like to explore different ways to practice. But I just, it's just so so interesting for me to think about that there are so many ways to do mindfulness, uh, and really what it looks like for me. Uh, it may not how how it may not be how it looks for you. And I wonder if maybe, uh, yeah, we might want to hear from from Leanne. We may want to hear from Leanne. Um, so I will just do a brief introduction to Leanne. And Leanne does not always speak about herself in the third person. Uh, so I um, I am the mom to a an almost twenty three year old um, autistic daughter um, who has struggled with mental health her whole life. Um, and so looking for support for myself uh, has been also part of this journey. Um, but I had a little bit of a different introduction to mindfulness as a caregiver. 
My introduction to mindfulness was during a really traumatic period in my life as a caregiver. Um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that I was drowning in despair and I was trying to figure out how to keep my child safe while also still working. At that time, I worked in a school and in the middle of this crisis that was going on at home, the school staff were kind enough to offer a professional mental health day. Um, and I was encouraged by my colleagues and my friends to join the mindfulness group since so many people knew that I was struggling. I remember very little beyond just joining the group. Um, I remember being coached on how to breathe. I remember being handed a grape to suck on. But that's when the panic started to set in. I felt trapped. I felt suffocated. I felt paralyzed. I needed to run out of the room. But it was, I was definitely acutely aware that there were other participants who were engaged in their mindful moment and in the practice. Um, I don't know how I left the room, but somehow I did. But I did leave the room feeling much more traumatized and much less stabilized than I had before. I felt utterly violated and I felt humiliated. My next introduction to mindfulness was after spending 24 hours in the emergency department with my daughter. It was clear to the emergency department physicians and staff that I was exhausted and that I was terrified. They suggested that I get a mindfulness app. Even those words felt like I was being re-traumatized. At that moment, my daughter wanted to end her life and the doctor was suggesting that I become mindful. It enraged me and it felt offensive and dismissive. So you can imagine my surprise a year later when my very wonderful, very insightful, very trauma-informed therapist asked my permission to guide me through a mindfulness activity, a mindfulness practice. I'm not even sure what the words were that she used because I was so focused on the fact that she had asked my permission. She explained the potential benefits and the risks. She assured me that she would be there with me and that the intent was to take a few minutes to be present probably for the first time in many, many years. She monitored my heart rate before and after the activity, and to my surprise, my heart rate had actually decreased. So that for me was the beginning of a new relationship with mindfulness. And the awareness for me, anyhow, <laughs> was that it needed to have a trauma lens. It needed to have an introduction. It needed to have a disclaimer. It became a safe tool for me to carry around. It was not going to save my daughter. I had hoped that it would be something that it would, but it wasn't going to do that. But it could offer me a perspective that maybe not everything is catastrophic at all times, that there are moments that I am safe. And I was sad that I missed out on many, many years of being present because of what I consider to have been a really poorly delivered message. So yes, I did a 180 on mindfulness. But understanding the risks and benefits, the importance of feeling safe was absolutely critical to me. So that I believe is an excellent segue into Nathan's discussion about things to think about. And thank you so much for listening. That was powerful. Thank you very much. Um, mm, mindful moment. Um, so Adeen and, and I are gonna give you a little bit of things to think about before we have our panel discussion. So, as Leanne said, mindfulness-based programs do have some risks in the same way anything has risk. For example, helping you, uh, running can uh, help you lose weight, but it's hard on your knees. Or you can take a daily aspirin, but it can cause nausea, heartburn, stomach cramps, and gastrointestinal bleeding. But these potential adverse effects do not take away from aspirin's many benefits. Instead, detailed knowledge about the benefits and risks allow us all to make individually educated decisions. I, as Leanne powerfully put, one of the risks for in some mindfulness programs um, is there's flashbacks, feelings of upset, panic for those who have experienced trauma. And if you aren't given the resources to work through those issues that come up, there's the potential for re-traumatization. It could be helpful going into pro mindfulness programs knowing you are not going there to find solutions. Instead, focus on the things you may gain from it. That's something that has been my unlearning. 
Um, some mindfulness programs are not designed with your cultural background, your learning style, or your accessibility needs in mind. For example, not all learners respond to images, symbols, and metaphors, such as imagining the leaves on a stream. Some programs require physical and sensory exercises that may not be appropriate for everyone. For example, breathing exercises may be difficult for those on a ventilator or those with asthma and chronic lung diseases. If you're being offered a program, I'd recommend you contact the mindfulness teacher ahead of time to discuss what they will be teaching and the accommodations you may need. And if you're engaging in self-directed mindfulness programs, it may be helpful to have a safety plan. And Adine? And the safety plan can include sharing your ongoing experiences with mindfulness with the facilitator or peers uh, to receive the care and support that you need. And the important thing is to validate your feelings. It's okay to say no to mindfulness if it's not working for you or if it's not what you're looking for. And while taking action to more clearly define our feelings and reactions are still important skills, there are other ways that we can possibly achieve this. And we recognize that setting tangible goals to find a sense of community and support are powerful to caregivers. And we also recognize that, that some may fear that they cannot say no to a mindfulness program that's offered because it looks like you don't want help or that it may impact on the availability of further support from the organization that's offering the mindfulness program. So lastly, remember your right to be informed about a mindfulness program. It's the same as when you purchase or accept any product or service. And knowing the facts will help you make the choice that's right for you. Um, for example, when we buy a, a food product, we often look at the ingredients. At the end. I'll I'll jump in here just for a moment, and uh, I just want to say like thank thank you everyone for who who shared. I think it was a, a really uh, good demonstration of the the different experiences people can have, and and to important to think about it and and to know the the ins and outs of what we're getting into. So uh, we're going to we're going to get into a bit of a discussion here. Um, so I would welcome you all. If you have any any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to use the chat. We're we're uh, we're going to try and keep to the to the chat function for this uh, today, if possible. Um, and we're going to have a, a a bit of a guided discussion now, and then um, hopefully, if time allows, we'll be able to address some some questions that that may be in the chat box. So, Yona, do you have any thoughts for us? Um, it's it's been a bit of an experience, um, kind of uh, this process of unlearning and talking and sharing. Um, you know, I think when when you first told me that you wanted this to be a topic, my first thought was, "Oh, great! I get to talk all about my work." And then I realized, "Oh no, you actually." have concerns about mindfulness and you don't just want to hear me talk about all my great work. <laughs> so it's like a sort of defensiveness and a bit of a fear, right? Like what, why don't they like me? Why don't they like it? So I kind of actually me, like I attached me to it, whatever it was. Then I realized, but actually the it is very different depending on how we all think about it, which is what I talked about before. But also that, you know, all the things that you've been talking about and sharing your experiences you know, obviously with everything that we want to put forward, it's like, this is something that might be helpful to you, you know, in these ways, in these circumstances, but that anything we want to present to people, you know, in a sort of, especially in a sort of therapeutic kind of way, we have to think about things like permission, you know, risks. So there really wasn't as much disagreement, I think, as I thought there might be, right? It's really more just recognizing, you know, how does something get presented to a caregiver in a way that makes them feel like they're being understood, like it will help them? And certainly like, um, you know, there's so many failures over and over and over again that caregivers seem to go through. 
and often kind of take on as their own kind of fault if they don't do it quite right. So if we set people up with mindfulness, which is supposed to be something that's helpful, and in the end, maybe it's a little bit harmful or they don't feel like they're doing it right uh, and they failed, like that's just one other experience that we've done, you know, which is not, I think, what people are intending when they think it might be something that, that has value. So it's made me think again about how we present things and how we support people and how we um, not only tailor, I think, what we offer, but really take our time to be present, I guess, to what it is that people are saying they're really needing. Like if you're saying right now, I need to do something to help my loved one, um, there may be some value in certain things you can learn at some point for yourself that will help you in helping your loved one. But is that what you're asking for right now? Right? So it's kind of like, not that mindfulness is a bad thing, but it's not actually going to, in the immediate, help you in your situation with your loved one. Right? Maybe there's some aspects of it that you can apply in a very difficult situation, which might help you manage this very difficult situation. But we shouldn't present it as though it's going to be helping your loved one directly if it can't do that, right? Because that's kind of like not listening. Um, so I think that's a big le lesson for me, how we present things uh, and also how much we have to learn from, you know, having conversations, having safe conversations. Like that's the other thing I guess I thought about in this experience is we were able to at least kind of revisit the issues, talk about them more, learn more in a way where it felt kind of okay for us to each express our opinions. Um, and and uh, yeah, I don't know. That's all. I'm just taking a moment to read some of the chat. I'm sorry. If anybody of our panel has a thought in response. Um, I know I, you know, it was an experience. I, I felt the tension. <laughs> Uh, with you, Yana, uh, uh, and, um, but, like, I think, for me, my unlearning was a lot like uh, Teresa's is, I've always been doing it, mindfulness, I just didn't realize I was, um, and I'm noticing in different ways where I'm, as we've been having this conversation, more and more where, where I could use mindfulness in certain experiences that I'm I'm going through, um, but it's yes um anyway I'm, I'm distracted there's too many things going on at once um it's interesting um i i've just gone full circle it's really uh, and i'm almost back to where i started back in <laughs> except i'm not a hippie anymore um uh, back in 1979 and seeing the value, I was wondering, my, my perspective changed after I had my son and it was very consuming. And again, looking for answers involving him, involving his suicidality, involving emergencies. And uh, then realizing the last, actually the last emergency visit, I did use some of the breathing exercises I became I, I had that bit of distance that I actually feel in that way, I was better at navigating that situation. And uh, if you look at some of these comments, Teresa, do you want to uh, address any of the chat? Yeah, some great, great questions and comments yeah. in the chat. Um, so we could, st and I'll, I'll, I'll look to, to Yona. So we have a question from Susan. So around what causes increased anxiety with meditation? Uh, if like there's hyperventilation or tinnitus happening, any any thoughts around that? Well, I mean, I think there's lots of things are going on, right? So I think first of all, you're noticing we're we're very good at not paying attention. So when we actually stop and we focus in on what's happening in our body, you know, it actually changes what's happening in our body. And I think it's this myth that if you focus on it, it will suddenly go beautifully calm and there'll be like flowers in the background. And like, that's not what happens. You notice it and it goes boom, right? So if you notice your anxiety, it might actually make you feel more anxious. If you're aware of your heart beating, then it may beat, it feels like it's beating more, right? Now, maybe in the long term, over many years of meditation practice, you actually start to notice that you can change what's happening with your heart, but that might not be the first thing you notice right away, right? So, um, and it may be sometimes it feels like it's getting bigger, 
but actually what's happening is you're just becoming aware of something that was always there. So it may not actually be increasing as much as you think, you're just being aware of it. Now I saw another question kind of connected to that, which is if, you, if I'm having say obsessive thoughts and I do mindfulness, does it curtail? And I think curtail is the wrong word there, right? Because it's like, well, then we're gonna stop the thoughts. Well, as soon as you start trying to direct the thoughts, oh my gosh, like whatever you do, don't think of whatever, you know, you say a word and of course that's the only thing you think about. So it's really hard to curtail it, but maybe there's awareness of it. And maybe you can approach it in a bit of a different way. So it's like, oh, what does that feel like? What does it look like? Where are you noticing that, right? So there's a kind of curiosity. You might look at it differently. And instead of trying to um, get caught up with it or um, really focus in on it, maybe it's just a different way that you're looking at it. So like you said, Aideen, when you were in the emergency, it was just a tiny bit of detachment you were able to do. Right, and it's because you'd practiced that skill for some time, so you could kind of call on it in that more stressful situation. It didn't get rid of what you were experiencing, but it just gave you maybe a little bit of breathing room. Right, so I think sometimes if you have that ability to kind of notice what's happening, maybe, you know, and there I just took a breath, maybe you just think for a moment before you respond. And just pausing maybe changes how you respond or it changes how the person you're responding to is listening to you, right? That's so another thing about mindfulness for caregivers is it's not just about what you're doing with yourself. It's also what you're bringing to the person you're connecting with, right? So how you respond to them impacts how they respond to you. And what you notice, not just about yourself, but what you notice about them can be different, right? Which can change an entire dynamic. Now, again, it's not gonna solve huge problems, but, Go for it, Nathan. That really <laughs> connects with, with that really connects um, because I feel like not only as, as a gay man do I see a lot of injustice, but as a caregiver dealing with what we deal with in like ERs, for example, I just want to reach out and like, why aren't you getting this and scream? That's not going to work, right? It, 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 there's a lot of systemic violence that, that we deal with. Um, and our loved ones deal with. And just being mindful in that moment is my own anger management, um, really. Um, and, and it's a way, and I can step back and look like I'm in control, right? I, I have, you know, I, maybe I can actually have a conversation with this person and get my like rage thoughts that I'm, you know, that help my kid, God damn it, you know, um, bring them down and go, look, this is what I'm experiencing. This is how I'm feeling. This is what it looks like to me. I know you're just one piece of the puzzle, but you gotta, you know, you gotta work with me here kind of thing. And I, I've noticed, you know, you do get received a little bit differently. You're not like that. And especially as a man, you know, with who projects very loud, it's, it's intimidating for people. So it's very good for me in these moments to go, okay, I'm not gonna get kicked out because I'm so angry kind of feeling. Um, Anyway, that's just my thoughts. Yes, Leanne. Uh, so I, I actually just wanted to, first of all, ask Nancy not to apologize um, for putting questions in the chat. That This is not a place for apologies. And I apologize all the time. Um, and it's a great question. Uh, I spend a lot of time um, in, a, in crises um, in hospital and I don't know. I don't, I'm not a specialist, so I don't, I don't, the only answer that I have to your question is speaking from my experience. Um, and it's, it's not in that crisis moment. It's not the time to try to learn how to be mindful. So it is one of those daily things like exercise that you have to practice when life feels beautiful and perfect in that bowl of cherries because it's in those moments where you can learn the skills. Um, and for me, it has helped me. It used to be a situation where everything in my life felt catastrophic and everything felt like a crisis. And I was so reactive to everything. And I, I, it was almost as though the, the small things, my, I, I convinced myself somehow I, I, that they were so incredibly catastrophic. But when I was able to sort of take a step back and observe them, yes, there were still massively terrifying moments. 
but other moments were less so. And when I was able to start practicing that on a daily basis, it did help me to dissociate less and to feel safer in those emergent situations. Um, and I don't know if that answers your question and I will apologize if it was not helpful at all. Um, but it did that it, the practicing every day is what made a difference in, in the moments of crisis. Just, just briefly, um, I just lost my thoughts. So, uh, Dean, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was going to bring this to you and it's, it sort of tails on with the dissociation moments and, and things that are basically traumatic and I'd like to look at actually mindfulness programs as opposed to mindfulness practice. And again, the two very separate things. How do we as caregivers and as clients and service users communicate the best way to, to about programs? Um, I know I'm very aware of the feeling I've got to accept this. It might not be the right time, but I'll lose all resources if I step back. I mean, what are your thoughts generally also in terms of trauma informed programs? Whether that's an element. Well, I think, you know, we, we really have to, um, whether you're a, a client of a service or a caregiver or whatever, like this idea that this is what we're going to offer you. And if you don't take it, we're not going to offer you anything again. Like if we're giving that impression as clinicians that that's how our services work without appreciating, you know, that one thing, like if the only thing you can offer is this one thing in this one way, then yeah, maybe they're, maybe, you're, maybe that's not the right fit, right? Like, I think we have to give the message that we can try to, I, I would love to, as a scientist, I want to figure out what works for who, right? Like I want to, I want to know who you are and like, are you someone who has a problem doing mindfulness sitting still? You know, are you someone who has your head so full right now, you can't even commit to doing anything on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, right? Are you someone who is dying to be with a group of other people? Or do you like to learn by yourself, right? Like all these kinds of things. And also, have you had experiences before that have been really hard or traumatic for you that are going to inform what's going to help you and how we should do things together? that kind of knowledge and then we can guide you to the right kind of thing for you that's that's where we want to get to right and i i think research can help us with that a little bit because we can learn again what works and what doesn't work for who but certainly i think if we are giving that message as care providers as healthcare providers that this is what you get this is going to help everyone and if you don't do it in this exact way you know see i don't think we're really giving i don't think we mean to give that message i'm not saying we're not giving it because clearly we are but I think as clinicians, as healthcare providers, we may not realize that's the message people are taking from what it is that we're offering. So we need to be a little more careful, I think, in terms of what it is that we offer when it comes to programs uh, and make sure people can um, understand about different options for programs, both how it's delivered and also the timing of when something should be delivered, right? You might need something for yourself right now, but literally what it might be is that you need to have a drink of water. <laughs> or you need an extra half hour of sleep, or you need um, some of the clutter and stuff in your house to be a little bit cleaned up a bit more. So we need to figure out how to do those things, right? Uh, it may not be that right now what you're looking for is something that's gonna help you in your day-to-day -day life um, on a more sort of psychological level. So kind of piggybacking off of that, as a caregivers, we're not gonna all meet Yona when we're, who's you know thinking critically about these things. When we meet facilitators, not all facilitators are created equal. So that's where this informed decision making and advocating for ourselves has to come in here as caregivers. And and I think that's part of it. And that's part of you know, talk to the person who is providing this to you. And how they respond to your answers will kind of give you a good indication. If Yona was my, you know, mindfulness guide yeah i'm signing up but if i had somebody who gives me excuses and just kind of dismisses and says things like oh well you have to get in touch with your pain i saw that in there those kind of things that just don't feel right with me no i'm not doing it you know i'll find somebody who can if that's available but mindfulness as i said at the beginning it seems to be everywhere so there's some options out there and 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 uh anyway that's 
That's what I'm thinking. I think that's a, a really, a really important message is that there are options. And I, I see a question here in the chat about being curious about mindfulness practice or options for someone who has trouble or difficulty sitting still. Um, and uh, I'll just share a little bit uh, from before I, I ask uh, Yona her her input on that is that uh, you don't always have to follow. Uh, you could you could also make it work for you a little bit as so you're doing like this, a self guided approach. Uh, I have a hard time personally sitting still, or I need to I I will need to to move around, and I'll 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 allow myself to do that um, because it's what I I adapt it for in my own my own practice to to what i need and i'm still getting the benefit from it but i'm wondering uh i know is the the israeli center does some work with that or especially for for neurodivergent populations and i wonder yona if you had a, a, a comment about that sure i'm just noticing in the chat nathan talked about how he practices mindfulness when he exercises or when he walks i know if you talk to people who are serious runners you know, it's very much sort of getting into getting into that zone or that space, right? Is an incredibly mindful space, actually. Um, but there's very much movement, right? It's about sort of, you know, organizing sort of how your breath is working with how your body is moving. And so there's, I mean, even in some of these very standard programs, like in mindfulness-based stress reduction, there's certain um, practices that get introduced first, second, third. The first thing you usually get taught is the body scan. Some people love the body scan. I personally did mindfulness initially when I was, you know, I had young children, I wasn't sleeping very much and I was guaranteed asleep within the first four minutes. And I don't think that was the purpose of the body scan was to take a nap, right? So that kind of being still noticing parts of my body thing was just not my thing. Um, but we also did mindful yoga um, or mindful walking, you know, and I found for me personally that the movement of yoga with my breath and noticing how my body feels in a certain position, Sometimes that might be something more attractive to me than just doing something while I'm still. But I think, again, if you think about what mindfulness is, and Kirsten's got a really nice comment here that we can bring mindfulness into so many types of activities that we do. It's more what we're bringing when we're doing the activity as opposed to what the activity needs to be. And thinking, I think, um, you know, speaking about, for example, with these videos around sort of neurodivergent practices for mindfulness that we developed um, with some autistic people who are involved in our program. And there's one that's about dance, right? Um, or about movement. So I think you've got to pick that thing, even the idea of stimming, right? Well, what is stimming? It's bringing attention to some kind of movement or activity that you're doing that you're really getting into, right? You're right there. It's not like someone is doing that activity and they're somewhere else. And it's something that is doing something that is modulating, that is helping that person. Um, it's very much about movement, right? So I think, again, how we define this, I think, is probably what needs to be a little bit expanded. And we need to get away from this idea that people have that to do mindfulness, you must sit, you know, quietly and say, "Om," you know, so many times for an hour with your eyes closed. And, and before we, we start to cool down today, um, I would like to mention, and this has been something that I've been going through as we're bringing it into all our practices. I am solution based. I'm solution focused. I want to change. I don't want other people to go through what I go through. Part of why I'm working with Israeli right now as an advisor is because I want to inform that and make sure other caregivers are not experiencing this in the future. I want to fix the system. I'm future focused. I'm not in the moment now, right? So how do I've had to, well, I'm still working on it is coming to terms with Let's bring those together. And you can be mindful when you're advocating. You, like, and you really can be mindful in uh, like my mindfulness and, and I take from my advocacy work. That is my form of mindfulness. It's, it's not, you know, nobody's teaching me that. It's just a way to reframe some of my solutions based, you know, yes, my kid is still suicidal. My kid is still struggling. Our family, we have not, you know, we have no resources, you know, the ERs are 45, you know, hour long waits and we never get in, you know, all of that is still true. It is still true. Um, I'm taking a breath from that because it's real. And uh, Adine has something to say and then, and then we'll cool down. Yeah, my, my quick unlearn from this is uh, you don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater, as it were. And you choose what works, choose the elements. And I didn't realize I was seeing it very, very black and white all or nothing. And uh, 
this has been a really helpful exercise doing the research and all of this. Um, Yona, what was your other? Uh, you know, how, how not to be scared of having conversations that are a bit messy, um, I think was my favorite on learn about this, right? To be able to just listen and that with good listening, uh, we can sort of find find ways to learn from each other, um, you know, that, that help that help me too, right? That help all of us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you everyone so much uh, for for joining us today and, and participating some some wonderful questions and comments in the chat. Uh, Yona, thank you so much for for joining us and sharing uh, your expertise and, and experience and, and Nathan, Aideen and Leanne. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, we just will have 1 final uh, slide that we'd like to share here. So there, there are some things happening at the Israeli center. Um, for, for mindfulness for caregivers. So there are some upcoming uh, courses starting in January for uh, family caregivers uh, with disabilities. And then also another session there specifically for caregivers to people with neurodevelopmental disabilities in March. Um, and we will, the, the registration opens soon for those and uh, we will uh, be sharing uh, the information in the follow-up email. And then uh, we'll also include this email, hcard at camh.ca. That's a, that's a go-to if you want it Hey, I heard about this. I would like more information. Send an email there and we will help you out as best we can. And then we'll also highlight that there is a, a great podcast, uh, Mindfulness for Caregivers with some, some recordings there. And we'll, we'll also send that out over email. Um, okay, so uh, a our few next, final thoughts. Our, our I, next I just, unlearn, you're going there? I was just gonna say it, but please, Nathan, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay, I just so, wanna make sure I'm excited. Okay, so that's the that's it for the slides. Thank you. Um, so uh, the next uh, webinar or lunch and unlearn in this series is coming up December fifteenth, and it's unlearning autism and psychiatry, and we'll be joined by Dr. Amanda Sawyer, psychiatrist. Uh, that should be a very interesting uh, topic in conversation. So we hope to see you there. Keep an eye out for that registration. In information. Uh, it should be ready uh, uh, next week. And then we'll also send out information about an upcoming coffee chat, co a, a version of a peer support uh, for caregivers uh, with uh, autistic adult uh, people in their lives. And that's starting January 18th, and it runs for six consecutive weeks. Again, we're going to send out everything over email so you have it handy to peruse at your leisure. And with one moment to spare, Thank you everyone for your time today.